Welcome to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello and welcome to the 31st episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis. My name is Dominic Guarino and I am the Senior Scientific Advisor for all things related to ligand binding assays, biomarkers, and flow cytometry. I've been with KCS for about seven and a half years, but I've been in the bioanalytical space for a little over 26 years. I'm here with my co-host, John Perkins. Hello, I'm John Perkins, Senior Scientific Advisor with a focus on all things LCMS. Um, I've been with KCS a little over a year, but I've been in, in bioanalytical LCMS for somewhere around 26 years. Today's podcast, as always, is brought to you by KCS Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCS is a bioanalytical laboratory located in Kansas City, Kansas, serving the pharmaceutical and biotech industries for over 40 years now. John and I are senior scientific advisors at KCS, and either or both of us are available to answer any questions you might have regarding this podcast or any of KCS services. We are glad that you are tuning in today. As I've mentioned, this is our 31st podcast. So if you're interested in other episodes, they can be found at kcsbio.com. As a reminder, you can also follow us on Twitter at The Weekly Bio and at KCS Bio. If you are new to the podcast, John is located in upstate New York. I'm in Kansas City, and our producer, Jeremy, is in uh, Missouri. This weekly podcast was started to give us a chance to connect with all of you during these COVID times, and we hope it is a chance for you to get to know us. And even more importantly, it's a chance for you to get to know KCS and the services we provide. As always, the podcast will be a review of the latest news and resources, and then a focus on a topic of our choosing before discussing any feedback we've had from you. We're constantly looking for topics, and we're happy to discuss something that you want us to cover. So get online, let us know your thoughts, please share anything you can, and we'll certainly try to incorporate it into future podcasts. So as I mentioned, we'll have a main topic, and then at the end, we'll give you a little teaser for next week, and we'll let you know what's coming up in the future. So again, we're Thrilled to be here. we got a jam-packed show. It's really exciting. It's all about mRNA vaccines. But before we do that, to kick us off for podcast number 31, we're going to let John give us a little bit of the news and resources. John? So as, as, as usual, for in terms of agenda, we'll start with the news and re- news section, which big big chunk of COVID, some non-COVID news, and a little bit more besides. Um, then we move on to our, our main topic, which we switched around um, with the with the emergency use authorization of the, the Pfizer vaccine and the likely same, same fate for the Moderna vaccine. We thought it would be good to talk about mRNA vaccines, the technology, the history, and how they work. Great, John. Let's jump right into the news. Yes, yeah, so usually we start off on COVID items and we always have our prompting list which says mix of good news and possible questions and this is is definitely where we start this week. We have the good news that we have the Pfizer vaccine approved. It's got its emergency youth authorization and Moderna is likely to follow and there's, there's some other developments that are not quite so good on the vaccine front. However, let's move to the first item is that with Moderna likely to have their emergency youth authorization today, I still say the youth rather than use, um, they're actually going to start a study um, dosing adolescents in a, in a vaccine study, um, a phase two, three trial um, for age group 12 and up. And the aim is to have a readout in by spring 2021 um, to get a measure for that group so that they can, they, they can have it ready for use for the 20 to 21 20 to 22 school year so hopefully try and return schools to normality it's basically, basically aimed to help teens with you know school closure keep keep them keep their development moving forward help with mental health issues that resulted from um from the the covid you know lockdowns etc so there's a lot lot riding on this this trial yeah, John, I mean, well, you, you touched on a couple of big things there. We know Pfizer's been approved, the Pfizer BioNTech, and Moderna's on its heels. It's going to be approved today, well, I believe today, uh, Thursday, the 17th of December, right? And and then you talk about this trial now, Moderna's going into adolescence, and that's really, you know, for someone who's got a 15-year-old son, I, have, I don't have as many reservations because I believe I have some knowledge on the subject, but I think I'd be really concerned um, to be you know, wanting to give this vaccine to my 12-year-old or 13-year-old, or in this case, a 15-year-old. And and then, 
because you have this hype around rushing it and all, all this sort of stuff. But I think, John, at the end of the day, this is definitely, again, another step in the right direction. We're going to talk a little bit more about how how safe we believe these vaccines are. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's going to be as it was when you were growing up, and you've touched on this, how you kind of had to line up on your way into school and get vaccinated. But I do think that, you know, this is this is the next step in um, defining it. I think early on when we talked about vaccines, one of the things that took long, you know, t- time wise, why a vaccine, why a vaccine can take several years is in part, you have to look at different age groups and just this seems like the natural progression and very excited for this. I, yeah, I, I it, think it's great. So yeah. So, so if you look at the um, the readout from the FDA assessment of, of the Pfizer uh, EUA application, they actually asked for it to be applied to 16 to 17 year olds based on the fact that 280 trial participants out of the approximately 30,000 were in that age group. And, you know, the, I think there was an eight to four split in terms of authorization of that vaccine. And the reason the four people said no was on that, that piece that they were concerned about that EUA, you know, basically stretching it to 16 to 17 year olds. So it's good to see that Moderna, as part of their program, are doing a formal study for this, you know, for that teenage group to really go to the next step. Yeah, John, it's just, it's natural progression and yep. stay tuned on the Moderna vaccine. We'll certainly, as soon as it gets approved, we'll share all of that in uh, subsequent podcasts, but we'll certainly be keeping our, our eye out on adolescents. And we really haven't even touched on that, you know, truly children, right? Below sure. the age of 13. That's yep uh, a gray area. And I feel for anybody, you know, I know our producers has some very young children. I'm sure they have questions about what I give this to my one-year-old child, but I think that's still to be determined. This point. I'm sure it will come at some point. Yeah. So n- next topic was um, FDA authorizes first at-home COVID-19 test available without a prescription. It's an over-the-counter test. Um, this is from LabCorp. It's called a Pixel Test, um, and you can purchase it directly from LabCorp for $119, but claim it back on insurance. Um, other approved tests like this do actually need a doctor's note. Um, so it's a case of in, swab the inside of the nose, seal your sample, and then ship overnight uh, in a prepaid FedEx envelope um, with results about two days later. Um, and it, and the, the, they hope that this will actually roll out to nationwide retailers rather than to have order rather than having to order it on the website. So another good step forward in terms of make you know really monitoring you know that if you if you're feeling if you're feeling ill is this the cause of your symptoms? Yeah, this is great. I think a lot of peace of mind yeah. for people if they can walk down to their local CVS, their local Walgreens, or Rite Aid, or wherever you might be in the country and. Um, you know, pay the out-of-pocket expenses and presumably you should get reimbursed for it and you can, uh, you know, sleep a little better if you're worried about COVID, right? I mean, I don't know. This is great. I, I think it's a wonderful step. And um, I think, uh, I feel like, John, uh, early on LabCorp was developing this. I can't tell if this pixel is the same one they were, that we mentioned. Oh, in late April, it is. So um, this is uh, great. Think about how quickly that has taken place to sure. go from Absolutely. approval in late April to you and I can order it on their website in late December. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, that one one aside, that they actually said that LabCorp is currently pro- performing more than a, a million molecular tests per week with a capacity of t- 270,000 per day at 21 labs to help diagnose active infections. It's quite an operation by the sounds of things. Yeah, I, John, I kind of just saw that. That is amazing. 270,000 tests per day, and it's about 21 labs that do this. So that seems like a pretty good level of output to me if that's just one entity doing it right and oh, yeah. I think there are several yeah, proofs yeah, because there's going to be other other labs doing the same thing just as a side note i still wonder if you know remember the nba had a rapid test they were using oh that's something we might want to look into i think that is where i hope we're going towards right I, do you recall that one john yep. where the nba yep. had uh yep what a swish they called it what do they call i forget what they called it but um that that one is one that for whatever reason just reminded me of that and again i uh, I don't know if we're ever going to be, you know, right now, a lot of places are taking your temperature walk in when you walk in. I don't know if it'll be as evasive as taking a little bit of a 
uh, swab out of your nose, but you could envision having to maybe spit into something. I, I, I think should the vaccine not come along, right? I think the one you you, you really hope for is is a saliva test that that's yeah. an easy sample to then get a, a rapid result from. That's what you probably most need. Yeah. So, so we move on to one of the questions. This this is this. So, so the the headline is Sanofi GSK hit with major delay in COVID nineteen vaccine program as the first jab flops flops in older adults. Where the, where this is interesting to me is you know everyone's excited about the mr mRNA vaccines, which when, in the early days of this podcast we were talking unproven technology, we we're suspicious about it. Watch out for things like the Sanofi GSK um, vaccines, which we know are, are going to be later in the, in development, but because it's a proven technology, this is likely to be your your best bet. And here it is. It's actually the, their first candidate has actually stumbled in phase one and, and not not shown efficacy for patients 49 years or older. Yeah, John, I, I think we're going to touch more on this in the main portion, so I don't want to steal too much of that thumber, thunder. But I will say that um, it's not surprising that your traditional vaccines – because of the, you know, they're, they're, they're just not, uh, as it says, insufficient concentration of the antigen. So this is why sometimes a vaccine can take longer. So they just need to retool it, sure. make it a little more potent, so to speak, and then move forward. But the problem here is it's getting, you know, it's COVID. There's a couple of candidates ahead of it. Couldn't have come at a worse time for them. But still, this, I, I do believe they'll, they'll have it ready in time. It's just, it's going to be months behind. And then again, I think you touch on another very interesting article around what if I get the Pfizer vaccine and do I get another one? If I'm on the if I'm on trial with GSK and um, well, we'll talk about that one, John. Yeah, so, so yeah, but just just to just to close out this one, I mean, GSK are not stopping here. Like you you mentioned that they're looking at another a, another um, you know an, another dosing regimen to try and address this because the recognition is whatever we do in terms of vaccines coming through are not going to be enough to address the worldwide need. Um, GSK and Sanofi are still thinking a Q4 2021 approval. There will be a need then. So all the candidates that we can get through, we'll need to address the global situation. And I just read something in passing very quickly yesterday. Um, WHO set up a program to really look at, um, you know, vaccination in in developing countries. And they're concerned that but that, that their funding isn't isn't enough, that they may not be able to, to successfully do what they've out to do i didn't read too many details about that's something i would like to follow up at another time but um yeah there, there there is this there's definitely going to be this need for as many vaccine candidates as we can get through to approval they'll have some applications somewhere on the globe yeah john you nailed it i think we're if the pfizer and the moderna are uh european us and have slight lead all these other uh vaccines are certainly have application for um other uh, countries and like you, the, the, what are there? I think there's almost three billion people on the planet, John. So it's going to be a long time before there's full coverage with the vaccine. So, and we'll touch more about this, I think, in subsequent um, discussions. So we'll we'll maybe move on. And and John, I think the next one is a <laughs> the next <laughs> article is oh, man. This keeps coming back, right? It's the it's the Biogen conference is linked to 300 cases. Why don't oh, you talk about okay, it? Yep. Okay. Yep. So absolutely. So, yeah, do you want to do you want to talk that one through, and then I'll go on to the ne- the one that I consider the head scratcher this week. But talk about the Biogen event. We move on to the next one. This is this becomes this is our head scratcher in in the in the articles that we we dug out. Um, and AstraZeneca have had this vaccine efficacy picture, which seems muddled and it still hasn't really been resolved. Um, but it, they've actually they're look they're actually talking about partnering with another um, vaccine. And this is um, it was actually with the Gamaleya Institute in Russia um, talking about pairing their Sputnik V with the AstraZeneca vaccine. It was actually Gamalea approached AstraZeneca rather than vice versa, which is interesting because Gamalea, shortly after Pfizer announced their efficacy data, announced that their vaccine was 92% effective. So I'm not sure why something that's 92% effective then needs to be paired with another vaccine for that little extra few percent. And particularly, I mean, they, they, they're sort of wondering about looking at the uh, dosing regimen that looks at all alternating doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Sputnik vaccine to give increased efficacy. 
I mean, I'll get, wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. We are looking at different vectors for delivery, which may make a difference. Yeah, Chad, just a really bizarre story, right? So um, as soon as there was 90% effic- efficacy on the uh, Moderna, excuse me, on the Pfizer BioNTech, Russia immediately said, oh, we're 92%. And now <laughs> it's, it's a mystery as to why a 92% vaccine would want to partner with something that's at 70%, right? That's where yep. AstraZeneca lies. And you know, it's called dubious and just downright stupid is what one virologist calls it, uh, Carl Zimmer here. And I, I, I think it's funny because they got Sputnik Five, and that's what Vladimir Putin received, right? So it's yeah. got, you can just see um, sensationalized news. And by the way, it's everywhere. I'm not going to try yeah. to say it's only in Russia, by the way, but you can see how they're sensationalizing it. And, and, and the reality is it feels a little bit like they're kind of hedging their bets and saying, oh, take both of them, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, it, then it, so it's like researchers say they can avoid vector immunity by combining two different vectors in a single regimen. Um, but the Sputnik Five already is two different regimens. So yeah, I, it's, yeah. I mean, we'll see where that goes. It may just it may just fizzle away to nothing. I just yeah, there's there's the head scratcher for the week. <laughs> it's not making AstraZeneca look great either. If that's no, right. it, it, whatever it, reason they're partnering with this Russian. S- sad, sadly, they, they, it looks like they, they're looking very muddled in their approach to this, and I hope that it, it resolves itself because it it, it doesn't. They, they're not showing well at the moment, and and we need them to. Yeah. We need their vaccine. Absolutely, because I mean they're with the Oxford uh, group yes. as well, which yes. is you yes. know we we talked about that. They're Oxford's pioneer in in vaccines, and you you want that legacy and history behind any vaccine. So same with you know Mark's coming up with one. We want all of them, John. There's no doubt. Even if we're not just going to rest on our laurels because of the Pfizer and the Moderna success, I think. I think we're going to keep trudging, as you just trudging forward. So, uh, John, uh, I, I know that 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 was a weird story for sure. Um, very bizarre. I'm impressed you dug that one up around um, AstraZeneca partnering with the Gamalea Institute and their Sputnik V vaccine. But, John, the next one, the next article, I, I can't help but laugh. It's it's about the Biogen conference now li- linked to over 330,000 COVID-19 cases, John. So. That, that's just amazing. And I, I, for those that haven't listened before, I was a week before, John, right? I was at that very conference or that uh, I was at that hotel about a week prior to. So I think I dodged a big bullet. But sure. John, uh, maybe tell us a little bit about details around these 175 people that were there in February. And now, man, it is over 330,000 330, cases. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, so they they had their meeting, which is in the relatively early days of of you know, early days in terms of cases in the U.S. and um, they they basically one person, I'm saying one person, one viral variant came over from someone from Europe, brought it over to the to the meeting, um, so that's your that's your locus for the for the meeting, and it spread from there. Um, and that one viral variant from that meeting has made its way to 245,000 people in the US. Another that emerged during the conference um, actually has then infected a further 88,000 people. Um, so they concluded that they you know they, they they it's been to dozens of states and 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 several of the countries and there was also I mean I I don't know what's happened to the case but there was the one executive who went went back to China and and tried to tell the the authorities there as she came back in the country that she hadn't been to this conference and I mean I know she was going to be in a lot of trouble from that I, I haven't seen any any more from that but it certainly it shows the effect of one what's a relatively small gathering I mean, if you said. 175 attendees but if it's the right conditions for transmission what a profound effect it can have yeah they're saying it's 1.6 percent of all u.s cases can be tied to that 175 person conference just mathematically a, a, a just an incredible um case study there i think you know john how much you studied this in terms of maybe more of your chemistry background but certainly in any sort of infectious disease courses and things like that you did a lot of you know, a pandemic and, um, you know, viral outbreaks and things like that. I remember studying them. I even remember teaching some of them. And we did, you know, you'd take a bunch of uh, dye colored water, you'd spike in a one uh, form of a benign um, viral uh, or a benign, I think it was um, some sort of uh, virus found in the dirt, very benign. And we'd, you know, sit there and make like everybody was kind of making out or some sort of 
contact, right? And then at the end of the class, you could go back and detect it. Well, this is unbelievable mathematical analysis, John. I, I think they're probably underestimating because remember, this number keeps growing, right, sure. John? I, yep. Think, yep. I yep. think that's where I, I believe there's probably even more related to this one incident just because it was, they say 99 people got sick, right? So, sure. and, and then of course it's international and, you know, I don't know, but I, I hope my little walk down memory lane wasn't bad, but I think it's, there's probably never been a better time to be studying at the CDC or in the virology space, or if you're an epidemiologist or in the, uh, pan, in, in these pandemics, this is, this has got to be a fascinating time to be in that space. And, and, and this is, a, I mean, basically this is going to be a case book, a uh, textbook case for people to learn from for years going forward, isn't yeah. it? So yeah, if my if our children if my son goes into biology he'll be reading about it you're right at the university sure. it, it is yeah go ahead next one sure. let's move just quickly back to vaccines we will talk, obviously we're going to talk a lot about mRNA later on as our main topic um, but the the third one that we've talked about repeatedly is the is the cure vac mRNA vaccine which is actually uh, has begun its phase two B slash three clinical trial. Um, they're looking at doing it in Europe and Latin America, and and they're hoping to have um, thirty six thousand participants. Um, it, it's similar similar in approach to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, but the difference for the CureVac, well, there's a couple of differences, but one of the main ones is that the it's actually stable for three months, refrigerated twenty four hours at room temperature. So logistically, if it does if it does show efficacy, it does get authorized, it will be much easier to distribute and then get out to the, the general population. Yeah, John, it looks like it's a little safer too, right? So it's a 12 microgram dose versus the 100 microgram dose for the Moderna uh, vaccine. So, you know, I, when I say safer, not, not that the, that implies the Moderna is not safe, but the less quantity, obviously, that, that in theory could potentially be um, safer. Although depends on the potency of it, which they've chemically modified. Excuse me. They actually do a slightly different approach. Um, they use untranslated regions to optimize the RNA rather than making chemical modifications. So again, th this is fascinating, John. This is the next evolution of vaccines. They're, they're come, you know, when we say the vaccines are coming, this is it. This is the future. Um, this is amazing stuff. You touched on the supply chain issue. Uh, th this one is is our um, sort of dark horse, right? We've been talking sure. about the CureVac one, and I think it's one that will um, probably have a more impact in, in the uh, lesser developed countries due to this supply chain issue. So hats off to them, and uh, we wish them uh, uh, the most. The, we wish them success in their phase three trial. At, at this point, John, I don't think they have any efficacy to date right their numbers are not out i, I think what all this shown from phase one is it, it it's about it's similar in terms of of immune response like you say the 12 microgram of the curevac is similar to the 100 microgram of the moderna and and the one and again this this may help curevac as it means because all they need is the 12 versus 100 they can make more doses so oh. If, if it's limited production, they can get more doses out of that limited production. So th 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 there is some, some benefits to that. Yeah, that's another great point, right? So 12, 100, that's seven, that's if eight, matter, more, right? yeah. eight, eight yep. times the amount. And that, yeah. So that's another excellent point, John. I hadn't even thought of that one. So there really is some upside to the CureVac. So, John, we're going to move on. We got – this is – boy, it's a – Jam-packed episode here, and we got lots of COVID, um, lots hitting the news. Uh, another big company, AbV, they pulled the trigger on a COVID-19 antibody, right? Going all in on um, drug discovery by Research Alliance. So, John, tell us a little bit about how they're repurposing things and, and maybe who they're working with and what this is all about. Well, this this is actually where other companies have repurposed antibodies in terms of the anti-inflammatories that really haven't shown much much efficacy. Uh, AbV is going with a with a new antibody that's been developed with um, Harbour Biomed and Utrecht University in the Netherlands and Erasmus Medical Centre. Um, so it's it. Is actually it was developed for SARS-CoV-1, um, but it actually shows promise for SARS-CoV-2 um, it, because it, it targeted conserved region of the SARS-CoV-2 spike pr protein, and they're also thinking it could also be used to use 
also used to treat um, other coronaviruses as well. Um, it's so we have obviously we haven't had their them associated with the vaccine route. This is this is an attempt to to really look at treatment rather than the, the preventative. So it'll be one to watch in the in the longer term. It's just started its 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 first phase one trial. So it's just a twenty four person phase one trial. So what just one to look out for. Yeah, and I think. For those that aren't familiar with AbbVie, they're a spinoff from Abbott Laboratories. They became like AbbVie's, you know, drug development or immunotherapy or immuno-oncology, however you want to think of it. But this is a heavy, a very heavy, you know, monoclonal antibody antibody company, right, John? They're, they're sure. Humira yep. is made by them. That That's the yep. biggest selling drug in the history of mankind. That's the monoclonal antibody. Well, I don't know if it's the biggest, but it's a, certainly the largest monoclonal antibody. And, and so this is great to see their efforts, their focus, and their energy going into therapeutics for COVID-19, because that's still, you know, we're years away from not needing things to treat people. Even in my own personal life, I had a a family member that got hospitalized this week, and they're fine. But these are the types of things that you want to see on the shelf in every emergency room to help. Um, So great stuff. So we'll move on to the last COVID item, and I think it is saving the best to last. I mean, obviously, we had the the EUA for Pfizer um, late last week or over the weekend, and the first doses were rolled out with Sarah Lindsay, um, who's Director of Critical Care Nursing in a Queen's Hostel, was the first U.S. person to be dosed with the vaccine. Um, I mean, she it, it's, a, it's a good story because she volunteered because she wanted to counter vaccine scepticism, particularly as a black woman who understands the legacy of unequal and racist medical treatment and experimentation on people of colour. And we touched on this, where, you know, the survey of frontline workers who are particularly minorities are really sceptical of these vaccines coming out. So for someone to step up saying, I'm going to take the vaccine, here's why I'm doing it, I think it is is really powerful so it's 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 great um as an as an addition to that obviously the the uk was a little bit ahead in terms of dosing um when the first two people in in the uk were um you know was was a, a 90 year old woman called margaret keenan and then william shakespeare which is who's the obvious like he's going to be the joke for years to come not him personally just the fact that william shakespeare was dosed so early but in the inter- <coughs> sorry, pardon. In the intervening week, um, almost one hundred forty thousand people in the UK have been vaccinated. So it, that's that's the speed at which it's it's moving forward there. Yeah, and so John, you, I love the way it's William Shakespeare. That's a great true pursuit question in time to come, right? But um, this story with uh, Sandra Lindsay is amazing, right? Lindsay is how you say that. Uh, she is a thirty. She she immigrated to the US thirty years ago from Jamaica. Worked her way up to, um, you know, the head of the um, nursing uh, director of critical care nursing. Just a great overall story. Sure. Now she's put herself in the limelight. She's put herself out there, and like you said, she's really driving the. Hey, roll up your sleeve and take the vaccine. So it, it's a really proud moment. I'll share that on Monday morning when this all came out, and I was, I think it was Monday. Um, I, I, the, you know, I tend to watch the local news, and they were um, showing. Uh, I think it was maybe Tuesday. So they were showing the first person vaccinated in Kansas. This was in Wichita and then the first Kansas City person. And it was just such a great moment, John. Like sure. this, it got it got my wife and I so upbeat. The day felt better. We all even my 15 year old was like, what are you guys so happy about? And we share with, so it just seems like this is such a good boost. The holidays are coming. It's so exciting and hats off to Sandra for uh being a pioneer and a leader for not just um you know uh Black women, but for everybody, for her to step up and say, "Hey, let's take this vaccine and let's get a let's get this uh, ship righted and let's get back to normalcy." So, great story and hats off to her and I love it, just absolutely love it. And and I'll say one last thing: all three former presidents are willing to put their um, that meaning um, Obama, uh, uh, Bush the second, and um, Clinton are all ready to take the vaccine publicly as well. So this is great stuff. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, so so we just got a message from from Erin to say that one of her friends, who's a doctor in Omaha, has just had the the he works on the COVID floor and he got the vaccine yesterday. I've done some digging in terms of Ithaca 
And um, right now, I'm, I'm not sure what the plan is. Um, the first wave of doses for New York State was 170,000 doses. We, and Ithaca, we, I mean, as I've mentioned on many podcasts, we have not really seen much in terms of infection rates or things like that here. So the southern tier, which we're involved, that we're part of, um, they got 4,500 doses out of the of the initial 170,000, the bulk going down to obviously New York City and Long Island area. So I'll watch with interest. Cayuga Medical, which is our, our main hospital, has said that they will have the ability to, to um, you know, obviously dispense the vaccine when it's available but it's there's no i haven't seen any concrete plan for here yet so we're still a little bit behind on that yeah no and it's just we'll definitely be covering this in terms of distribution what's remaining all of that will come out in time but it's it's wonderful and uh, now that i think about it i was texting my uh family this morning because there's a lot there's a big snowstorm in the new england area i think i gotta ask my sister who's a frontline nurse like when is she eligible? That's I hadn't even thought of my own sister being out there. So let, I'll find out more if she's going to get the vaccine and follow up in subsequent podcasts about that, because that is really exciting. And um, I don't know, John, I, I guess we'll patiently wait, but I think we're low on the list and uh, we might not be till April, May before we're eligible for a vaccine, yeah. but I will sure. wait patiently. Yeah, just very quickly. So I have had like a text conversation with a friend in Madagascar, and um, he he actually he, he sort of said, "I hear that the vaccines approved." So I've just sort of been, you know, sending things back and forward. And he sort of the, the last message this morning was, "People are worried about it." And I'm saying, "No, if you get the chance, take it. I will." You know, <laughs> it's like so. Yeah, seriously, if you get the opportunity and you're offered this, please please take it because it's in your in your long term interest. Yeah, well, have them have them tune into this podcast because we're going to touch on why you should in a minute here in our main portion but john let's wrap up the news let's just go we got two more items uh the next one is a non-covid issue we're going to switch gears to what is it sanofi and novo back a small biotech that's neck and neck with pfizer to develop a group b staphylococcus a staphylococcus vaccine so john maybe you can uh tell us a little bit more and what what why is a staphylococcus b vaccine so important well, it's it's actually streptococcus. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> It, never mind. Um, basically, it's a, it, they're looking to develop a vaccine to protect pregnant women and their babies from Group B streptococcus, which is generally harm, harmless in most people, but it can cause stillbirth and serious infection, leading to sepsis and meningitis for newborns. So, if it's it's not a high rate, but obviously it can be can be nasty if 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 it, if, it, if you know if it turns ma- malicious. Um, so it's it's a small biotech who have basically taken. Um, research at the University of Lund in Sweden um, and they're moving into phase two and at that stage where they're looking for more funding and, and this is where Sanofi and Novo com- come in, they're two of the companies that have provided funding to drive this this um, study forward to get them to the point of phase three um, and it, because basically the current standard of care is just to pump the mother full of antibiotics which don't necessarily work so if they have a vaccine that can count to that this is a much, much more benign and better approach to help mothers and, and babies out it's not like say i don't think it's a huge number of cases but it's um it, it it's a need and i i i like things like this because it's you know we focus so much on the COVID-19 vaccines but there's so many other um, indications that people are looking for vaccines for and i, I just thought this was a, a nice application yeah so john um i know i mispronounced uh, streptococcus but i read about this in a book called the cutter incident how america it's about america's first polio vaccine but they touch on how um back in the 70s, they had a vaccine for this, but due to the very nature of vaccinating, I think it ties into what happened in the UK with um, the maladies, the malformations of children due to um, what they were thinking. Yeah. So it's right around that time, right? So this this book, and and I read it uh, probably early 2000s or mid 2000s, but if I recall, they touch on how there are a number of vaccines that are available that because of public perception, because of this, how sensitive it is, what type of pregnant woman wants to be part of a clinical trial, this is rearing its head here. But John, the way I see it, this is curable. Yes. And this, that, that, like when you talk about curable, let's eliminate these things. And I know there's maybe, maybe the, the big push through the COVID vaccines will allow for this 
uh, streptococcus vaccine to finally make its way. But John, there's actually within that Cutter incident book, they talk about how there's there's just a huge amount of like, um, I, I don't know for lack of a better word, it's just a war chest of law <laughs> money sitting there with these vaccine companies. Like, I guess it's like tort law or tort law. I don't, I don't know the legal terms for it, but all of these vaccine companies have a massive amount of legality to them as well, which we, which we don't know much about, but this book talks about it. And, and in particular, they shelved this, um, you know, group B streptococcus vaccine, even though it was effective. So great to see this making its way. And I'm sure maybe some of our listeners have had, uh, the unfortunateness of this, and I, I, God, I hope not. But anything that can be curable, John, you and I are, are definitely thinking. Let's just get this done. And yeah, so and just to mention that this is up. Uh, Pfizer have a vaccine for the same application, also in development. Um, so the, the, obviously, this this article was 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 focused on Minerva X, who I think of the company, um, and they 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 are convinced that their technology is 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 more more efficacious. So we'll. I, again, we, we're we're always scouring the news, so I'm sure we'll see, read more about this in the future and yeah. hopefully update. So, well, it was a great read, John. Great read. Really enjoyed that one. So let's move to the last news item before our main topic, and it's 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 a a, com, a completely different um, slant on things. And I think we we talked about our main topic for this week was going to be um, the top ten manufacturers and their support for for COVID work. And as as the um, EUA for Pfizer as that was approved, we thought it made more sense to actually focus on mRNA vaccines. But this, it must be an exciting time to be a contract manufacturer because, you know, obviously there's always opportunities, but this sort of trying, this must really push your systems, COVID, etc. And and planning for the future, not just planning for dealing with COVID-19 and the logistics associated with that, but thinking ahead for what what happens if there's subsequent COVIDs, you know, does other other um, viruses make the transition into human? So this is Thermal Fisher Scientific, who, um, I mean, they're, they're huge. I mean, I, I, the, where I knew Thermal from um, was actually a, one of my friends who, who did, did a PhD with me, he went to work for um, Finnegan, who are a mass, mass spectrometry company in, in the Bay Area. And um, they were bought by Thermal. And for a while, became Thermal Finnegan. But then I think then Fisher were a big lab supplies company, so they became this They'd be they're just massive. Anyway, um, as part of this, um, Thermal Fisher are basically – looking to expand a, bot, a lot, a number of their facilities or build new facilities to um, help deliver um, doses for new COVID-19 products and beyond and for th new therapeutics, you know, and, 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 terms of diagnostics and they're looking at facilities in North Carolina, Italy and the UK. And I, I like, like I said, this, it's sort of fascinating in terms of, I love the logistics of things. I always liked, you know, when I ran um, sample analysis group in my previous life, it was always that how many samples can you cram through? How can you keep your instruments as busy as possible? Because ultimately you're meeting customer deadlines. So this logistics piece, and you know, it's, it's interesting. There's like there's live virus filling lines. They're also the, the the UK facility in Swindon. They're talking about having extensive cold chain storage. So planning ahead for additional vaccines that might be, I might have the similar limitations to the Pfizer BioNTech. So I I thought you know. Just as a, it's a, a little bit of a tangent to what we normally talk about, but just a, a, a really interesting um, piece of information. Yeah, no, John, I'll just add that Thermo has become so big. They're Thermo Fisher, but they own life science technologies. They own a company called Gibco from years ago that I know. And then Pierce is another company they've uh, gobbled up. Um, I think those are the three major ones. And I feel like. Um, there's another one, but like you said, they're enormous. And, and actually, they're sometimes I don't always love that, but they're actually really easy to work with. You can still see some of those name, name brands. They they haven't really fully assimilated. They Well, they have, but they haven't. Anyhow, this is a, a great story in terms of just the sheer movement in, as you said, in the CMO space or the manufacturing space. This is a tremendous amount of horsepower they're putting in Greensville, North Carolina, 130,000 square feet, John. And then they're expanding all over the country. But 
more importantly, it's it's not just COVID. I think what COVID did is it exposed us a little bit. Sure. Yeah. And so I think this is like there's there were some other articles that we didn't touch on around um, large skill for monoclonal antibodies and, and and just everything so that when when then because it's going to happen again, right? I don't want to make everybody scared, but we're going to have other um, outbreaks where it's just we live in a world that's full of um, all sorts of wonderful creatures and some of them become bad right so um, th this is going to happen again and now we're uh, ever more prepared to ensure that we can deal with it on a uh, manufacturing level e even in our space john we're feeling this as well i feel like even our organization is ramping up right so this is I i'm glad you i'm glad we talked about it but i think the take-home message is we're learning the scientific community, both pharma and biopharma, they're learning from this and um, we're going to be prepared in the future. So great job. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that that the eye to the future is, is really key in all this. And just one other one other thermal product that is absolutely essential to our business function is the Watson limb system. That originally came from PSS wow. and PSS and actually there's it's an interesting story. The actual um, precursor to Watson was a, a limb system called DM Limbs, which was developed by a guy called Gary Rathmill who who worked for Roche. He then spun out of Roche um, and moved from I think I'm not sure even what what system DM Limbs was based on, but it was one of those things. If you made an error in a screen, you had to scroll through multiple screens to get back to the same spot to correct it. So he then went to what he built what. Watson, much more user-friendly system, and then long-term was bought out by um, by, by Thermo. But that, that has become the limb system, limbs of choice for, for bioanalytical labs. John, you know, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word Watson and they think of IT, they think of IBM, and that's a misconception there. So even myself, when I first heard about Watson Limb, I don't know, 15 years ago, I thought, oh, does IBM make that? So it does not, right, John? Yeah. So the good yep. stuff there. So, um, John, this has been great. Uh, we're going to dive right into our main portion, right? This is, um, I, I think, a great topic. It's on mRNA vaccines, the technology, the history, and how they work. Uh, no, excuse me. We're going to jump right into the main topic. We're going to talk about mRNA vaccines, the technology, the history, and how they work. So, John, um, I think the first story, the first item we're going to talk about is the mRNA pioneer why don't you take us away and tell us a little bit about her the, the, with with any of these these new technologies it, it's if if you get it's great when it meet, hits the mainstream media because you get to learn about the people behind them and um th th this is a great story because it it shows um the app that if someone believes in an idea the pursuing of it to eventually get it to where you know you have to hang in there to make it happen, and eventually, you, you hopefully you'll reap the benefits. But the um, the 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 main driver of 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 mRNA from the early days and our belief in RNA research is is a woman woman called Katalin Kariko, who's a Hungarian born born biochemist. Um, so basically, her whole life has been devoted to, to to messenger RNA. She was working at the University of, I think it's pronounced Szeged, in um, in Hungary, but was invited to join Temple University in, in Philadelphia. Um, so she or she came to the US with her husband, her two year old daughter, um, along with a teddy bear that had nine hundred pounds or around sort of twelve hundred dollars sewn into it, which was from the sale of their car exchanged on the black market. So they Kate, that was all we had with them coming into the country. Um, she moved from Temple to Penn School of Medicine, um, where she she saw that mRNA worked, but their biggest issue was it, it, it was it, it couldn't, I think in terms of dosing, it couldn't the, the safety profile was was adverse, um, and she also had real trouble with getting funding. Um, she wrote for grant after grant after grant, but um, she, I mean, she in in nineteen ninety five she was actually demoted to an adjunct position. Hang on, um, anyway, sorry, so I want, let's go. I want to make sure everybody understands the timeline here. Sure. So in eighty nine, she joins the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. So back in yeah, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah. They're looking at putting mRNA into people. So this is not, I want to, I think part of this, the point of this 
main portion of our podcast is to introduce everybody that mRNAs are not that new. So sure. uh, you're right. She goes, she goes there. It, it kind of, as you say, there's a little bit of a, I don't know if a setback, but there's certainly not a lot of interest. She can't yep. get grant funding. So then in, um, I think you were going into, I was, I, I, it reads 1998. She, she then goes a very famous individual, Drew Weissman is who that's of HIV vaccine notoriety, right? I don't, I don't, I certainly know that name. She ends up connecting with him in 98. Take us away, John. Sorry. Yeah, so, no, 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 absolutely not. If you want to take it in with us, that's fine. Because I, I didn't know much about Drew Weissman. I mean, so I was learning about him. No, uh, it's okay. I, I think it's more about, um, so Drew Weissman in 1998 isn't famous. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. that's part of it. It's this, when you think of universities in this country, from Stanford to even U, UP, UK, University of Kansas to Pitt to Ithaca, there's there's just these think tanks all across the country. And UPenn is one of them, and these people are engaging themselves. So yeah. that, that's more about where the sidebar comes from, because he's not, HIV is still kind of evolving. He, he doesn't yeah. become more famous until right around this time, I think he's gaining it. But certainly by the mid 2000s, he's a pioneer. And I think it's the key, part of it, the, the key quote is in 1998, Drew Weissman, who was working on HIV vaccine at the NIH, joined the university. And, and she said, I met him at the Xerox machine and told him I could make any RNA. And that was where their partnership really kicked off. So they, they, start, they started working together. And 2005 was where they made the breakthrough that really has helped everything move forward from there. Um, so the trouble with messenger RNA was it triggered an inflammatory re reaction when injected. However, if they found that they could modify one of the mRNAs for building one, one like a, cu a couple of nucleosides within, within the mRNA, they could get round that inflammatory response. So, uh, but even then, it's sort of they published the discovery, but no one no one really paid attention um but then it's sort of it obviously um i think she went on to work she went on to BioNTech, but um derek rossi who was one of the founders of moderna who we'll touch on later um did pay attention to this and you know that this is where moderna's involvement in this this technology comes from yeah and and so that again all these names are kind of percolating uh you mentioned derek rossi uh but you're right so so uh um uh Carrick, carico i think that's how you pronounce her name i don't know if i got that right john um she she uh proceeds to diverge into the BioNTech sector in 2013 and then she's offered a job with moderna right um yep. over time and now you know the rest is kind of snowballing in fact i believe she is as she's up for the Nobel Prize in chemistry, well, right? I, I, think it, I think it's been suggested that she is worthy of the, the Nobel Prize. And honestly, if it turns, I mean, we we're, we're, we know these vaccines are going to go through to approval. If it, it depend, looking at the number of lives that will be saved as a result of that, I mean, it should be a very worthy recipient. Yeah, and I think um, maybe it's a co with Derek Ross. Yeah, somehow. I, I think I think so. But th this is amazing, John. I, I hope every young scientist that's on the phone knows that like there's there's so much don't worry uh, how do i say this just work hard believe in something right believe have passion and not like and not with rosy colored glasses right so she she became an overnight success that took her i don't know 30 years john right so years, I that's said. how you think of it yeah and so and and now you know these mrnas because of the advancement that's happening it, it can be a universal platform and it could treat just about anything, right? That's what we're starting to think about in terms of, you know, as soon as the this, I believe it will become the mainstay way of doing vaccines. Although again, we'll to be determined slightly there, but I think you'll see a lot of effort into other disorders, and we're going to touch on some of those companies that have been using mRNAs to treat all different sorts of diseases. I, th I think there's a it, there's a there's a, a perception out there or a viewpoint out there that this is going to be the technology of the future. Um, it's it the, the the key being that this is a synthetic process to make these vaccines, so it's a chemical process rather than a biological. Um, I think when when you get the um, when the sequence of the actual virus becomes available, it's, it, I think it's, it's relatively quick to then build a, a vaccine that can counter that. This is, I mean, this is this is the key here. There's no, 
there's no biological um, components associated with this. So this this helps counter, you know, the some of the questions that we were dealing with last week. Does it have, you know, uh, is there cell stem cell particles in this? Are there other pieces that we should be worried about? It's not. It's it's a it's a chemical process. It's a it's 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 um it's your active um sorry it's 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 the it's the mrna encased within uh within lipids to deliver it into the body and, and it's all it's all synthetic chemistry at work here it's away from the biological piece of it john it's it's basically like kind of getting a small molecule injection is what you're kind of going at even the, you, you you're so, John, I think we we wanted to make sure we touched on some of the pioneers. And uh, before we jump off of that and jump into our next sort of agenda topic, and that's more in, in detail around the vaccines, um, re- just the one last note, persistence in the face of research setbacks is what I was driving at, John. But back to what's happening here. So these, as you said, and, and I think some people might get a little bit um, – sensitive to what you're saying, John, in terms of it being chemical. and But look, that's like what an aspirin is, right? So everybody needs to understand what John's saying there. This a lot, And, and by the way, it's in uh, liposomes of technologies. Again, uh, uh, my one of my first mentors, his name's Bruce Babbitt. I met him at Cellcor in the early 90s. He was working on liposomes at Tennessee and Harvard um, back in the 70s and 80s. So this is not, again, where some of this stuff is just, it's been around a long time. It's just never come to the forefront. So but but to John's point, the way the the way this is manufactured, people have to understand you are taking so many synthetic and chemical things that th- you shouldn't be afraid of this. And you need we need to embrace it. Remember, we're living a lot longer on these things. People sure. are living much healthier on these things. So we have to realize that this is like th- this is why people go to school to research chemistry and, and biology. Yes, yeah, so so my my early morning regimen is 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 a torvastatin for high cholesterol, hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril for high blood pressure. Um, cur- currently, I'm taking Advil because my back's giving me hell, and then and then uh, Mucinex because I'm like stuffy in the morning. But all, that's that's I just view those as the equivalent to this. I view no difference between the two. The fact that it's a large molecule versus small molecules makes no difference. It's helping me in the process. And like I say, there's I mean this. I, I picked up from a, a, an interview with Drew Weissman. He basically said, none of this is made in mammalian, mammalian cell lines. And this should counter a, a lot of this sort of scuttlebutt about, oh, but there's all this stuff that we, we need to be worried about because of, you know, active viral pieces, et cetera. Yeah. It's I, just, I hope, we, uh, I, hope it, I answered that, John. I, sorry to talk over no, there. I hope that has been answered. They, it's a release test that they might use it for, and they can stop doing that. There is no fetal or mammalian cell lines being used. So let's, let, everybody needs to hear that loud and clear. That is a manufacturing thing and absolutely not needed for making, or uh, it's not in the actual vaccine. Mm-hmm. So John, I got to get back to all the things you're taking. As a side note, I take a, a, a men's vitamin and today, uh, lately I've been using like this fizzy immune boost. So I, I do like the synthetics, but I think in a different way, I can't remember the last time I took an aspirin, John. So I think it's, um, I love the fact that you're sharing that, but I can tell you as I'm rounding up towards 50, John, I'm going to embrace life by chemistry because it's coming for me. I well, absolutely know it's coming. Just to give a background to the atorvastatin, it, it's, it's you know, I remember coming over to the US in 89, um, and that was when, you no know, high cholesterol was a big deal. And so I think it was first part of, you know, starting with the company, um, I was asked to, you know, have blood tests, and I got my cholesterol reading, and it was through the roof. And, um it, and but my diet wasn't unhealthy, so I went through this paranoid process of eat, trying to cut out fat from my diet. And then I actually looked at my family. My mum was on simvastatin, um, so the the, the Merck drug. And ultimately, what it comes down to is from her her line. Um, I'm a big cholesterol producer, so at that point, once I realised that, I backed off from really amending my diet. I, I eat a fairly you know, I, my diet is not an unhealthy diet, um, but my cholesterol is through the roof. So I started off on, you know, the smallest dose of a Torvastatin quickly escalated. And I eat, have this tablet every morning, which is 
mammoth the 80 milligram tablet but it's i mean it's it, it it's just you that yeah. your body does a thing you counter it and that's where it comes from yeah. I, john i always i'm i'm again very lucky to not need any of that but i, I think a lot of it as you know is i'm just kind of crazy with working out I, i'm gonna attribute it to that i love to put my body and press it and all that i think that helps and i don't know John, I probably <laughs> let's move on because right, right, I don't right, want to talk right, about right, my cold right. showers and all the other silly things I'm doing to combat having to take uh, chemicals uh, or at least life through chemistry, which again I am totally going to embrace as I, I can feel it coming in the next decade for sure. So, um, John, I think we're we're running a little long on time. John, I just looked up. I can't believe. Uh, I feel like we I feel like we cannot get into um, like the mechanism of action of the mRNA vaccine. I think we should just stick to. Let's, we're going to have to truncate some of this, John. And it's been a wonderful conversation. We can get back to it in future things. Let's can, talk, I, can I just I just I just found a I found one article later on because I was jumping about all over the place. The key to both vaccines is mRNA, a single stranded messenger molecule that delivers genetic instructions from DNA called up inside the cell nucleus to the cell's protein make, making factories outside the nucleus. In the case of the vaccines, the molecule instructs cells to start churning out the harmless spike protein as a warning to the immune system to mobilize against coronavirus and that's that's really how it works and then just one last thing the adaptability of mrna has opened up a new field of therapy not just for vaccines but also for medicines and areas ranging from cancer to strokes and cystic fibrosis so that's the potential of this and, and i just like so i just thought that was a good quote if and we can we can no, then move no, on but, from I, that. but i think well now you've opened up a little bit of a pandora's box because i think some people are going to hear some of that and get worried but okay. like, unpack what you just described happens to you all the time. You intake things that have, find their way into your nucleus and can incorporate into your DNA. That that's what's happening. Like we, we it's just this is strategically designed. Yes, it's a little bit more like a you know a heat seeking missile, so to speak. But foods you eat, things you take, sit, toxins. Hey, don't go down a city street because you're inhaling things that are going to get into your DNA. You have to trust. That if you have a healthy immune system or even you, there's so much overlap in your body that it just gets incorporated and flushed out. And in this case, it's getting incorporated and making something that protects you. Bingo. Yeah, wow. Yeah. This is great. So I'm the Pandora's box, but also it's a good cue for you to, to – I agree with everything you're saying there. Yeah. No, and I didn't mean to say Pandora's box because I think a lot of people at least – so I'm, I mean, the number of people asking me these questions when they find out I know a little bit about it. And by the way, we should preface that these are just John and I's opinions. This is not a KCS opinion. And none of this, you need to talk to your physician about things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when people gravitate towards having a little bit of knowledge, they're genuinely worried about, they, they're reading what you're seeing and they're worried about it. But hopefully when someone shines a light on it like I am, like this is happening to you all the time. When I was in my immunology degree, taking it, you cannot live in a bubble. You, you got to get one at the environment. Dirt is okay. And if you're so scared of everything, I'm telling you, don't walk down a city street because you're inhaling yeah. all sorts of stuff. And yet your body is just a mass of multiple chemical reactions going on at any one time. I mean, that's that's what your body is, yeah. you know. It's, it's yeah. one big piece of biofilm too. Yeah. Now yeah. Getting real, so. But John, that, that's great. I, I, I think we can go. We did touch on the mechanism there a little bit. But let's talk about some of the heavy hitting companies so that our audience understands that mRNA medicine's been around a long time, John, right? Like there are some really good companies out there and you touched on some of the diseases and i'll say there's a lot of orphan diseases that mrnas have been going into these individuals for a long time john and when i say orphan diseases those are kids that have some genetic disorders typically children because they don't live a long time they have genetic disorders they lack things like certain enzymes they are solving and curing these diseases with mrna and john here's the kicker if it can go into somebody that's immune compromised, that has all sorts of disorders and be safe for them because this has been going on for decades. You got nothing to fear, right? Sure. John? I, mean, I think there's, and maybe we'll, I'll stop there, let you talk about it. But still, this is a wonderful, tell us a little bit about some of these companies. I'm, I'm not going to say too much because like, obviously we're running very long, but I, I mean, all, all the time I've been in bioanalytical, there has been, you know, I, I remember talking to my prior bosses about, you know, um, the potential of the the companies who are working in the RNA field there there's obviously there, there was a there was a lot of attention on the potential there but it took a long time to get 
them to market. The first approved drug I should have noted the year, I think was 2017, and it was Alnilam, um, and it was an siRNA to treat a rare hereditary disease by silencing a specific gene. So there you have the orphan drug application. The actual second drug approved was another Alnilam drug. Um, we also have Ionis, who are working on an antisense RNA, and they've got... Um, three approved drugs out there and we've talked about deciphers one of the fierce 15 um a, a while back and they, they've got three rna um drugs in clinical trials and extensively partnering with large farmers so there's a huge belief in this technology out in the industry and i think yeah, the fact that you talk about the the safety profile and the ability for immune compromised people to deal with them is, is you know is huge yeah you nailed it so al nylum is the company with the first it's 2017, and then they've had, I think, at least two others. You mentioned Ionis, and then Dicef, Dicerna, or Dicifera. Yeah, Dicerna. Dicerna, excuse me. They have approvals as well. I think that one happened maybe within the last year, right? I feel like we talked about that one. But those, and, and there are others. I, we don't want to just limit it to them. Obviously, Moderna is another one. They're a pioneer in this space. True. But, but for those that don't know, go look up the history of these companies. They got approval in 2017. That means they were dosing for decades. This, I think there's such, um, anything new gets resistance, John. And that's part of it. And I, I've had some other stories where friends, they, I think people who have conservative doctors, maybe even doctors that have been a little bit, maybe 30, 40, 50 years in the industry, they, they're they really putting beliefs into people that I think are hurting the mRNA vaccine space because it's unknown to them and they never really have researched it. So, and I mean, I don't want to take a knock at too, too many people here, but, but I don't, and, and I don't mean to always say question your physician, but if you're getting, if, if you have a physician that's telling you these aren't safe and things like that, go get a second opinion then, because th this, I, I hope we're really driving home the message that this is, these people have been putting mRNA into people, very sick people for decades and not having safety issues. So I, I don't, Fear the long term, like you said, John. When we first started talking about this eight nine months ago, we lacked some of this knowledge. As we've begun to dug in and dig in on this, it's like, oh my, there's way more history with these than we're given. That that's been certainly in the mainstream media and things like that. We just it just should be noted here, John. So I I, I think we got one last look. This important thing because I do want to touch on Moderna's history, right? That's yeah, the last really, yeah talk absolutely. About. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I this I, I where this came from. I was actually looking for some of the history of of you know RNA based drugs and stumbled across this this article um, in Stat News, um, January twenty seventeen, and the headline was Moderna hit safety problems in bold bid to reinvent medicine, and. Um, it, it's so funny because this three years ago, actually almost four years ago, and some of the claims that um, Stefan Bansell was making then, he's making now, where he was talking, uh, I mean, they talked about the, the, the company's huge future. Um, and I'll, I'll give his final quote, which is really quite prescient in the end. But, but what they, they, they were, obviously, they believed in this um, early on. They they had vaccines in the pipeline look, pro, look promising, but they really wanted to, to hit um, orphan therapies because that's, you know, obviously it's un, unmet medical needs and, and a good return on investment. They, they, they generated an awful lot of money, but they spent an awful lot of money in terms of um, developing their technology. <clears throat> and Bansell was was convinced that you know their technology would change the world, but a lot of the problem was they had um, they couldn't get the drugs into human because of side effects. Um, and it, I think it was down to their early delivery technologies. What you're seeing now is not only if, as the RNA field move forward, but the drug delivery um, technologies have moved forward immensely in the last few years and this is how things you everything comes together to make things work i'm going to pack off and let you say what you yeah. want to say and then I'm, I, I have a couple more things to add no sure and, and I'll, I'll add like so moderna is founded in 2012 we talked about some of the pioneers in this space they're all working in the late 90s and so there's probably a decade of research in academia and then these companies start sparting up most notably um, Moderna, they, they, they're a big splash, right? A billion dollar evaluation in 2012, right? They, as you said, they're spending 
uh, tremendously. They're having, I don't know if setbacks is the right word, but they're having challenges. I don't, I, I, it's not surprising that they, you know, as you start something, John, it, it, the potency of it, the dosing, all of that is hard to hone in on. So, yep. I, so as we back to like today, all, all of that's been vetted out back in these times. And, and again, in people that were really in desperate need and, and, and there's no talks of anybody dying here, John. So, that that, that no, I think no, it, it it didn't. There's no one dying because for these they 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 were they were basically figuring out the technology and they didn't get into man, so no one was adversely impacted by this. It was still on that animal stage. But I'll, I'll get, I'll, again, let it get you go. No, so but I, I think as it goes into humans, though there isn't because they start. What do they start doing? In um, I believe it's seventeen. They start dosing. They have strains for influenza, Zika virus. And they say the fourth remains a secret. So we didn't even talk about the Zika virus. Remember, that was really popular yeah. back yeah. seven, ten years ago. So the, the, I, I'm again, I don't know the whole history of Moderna, but I imagine at some point they're going to start getting into clinical trials that date back quite some time. So, so John, I, I think my take home message here is like, um, and, and then in this article that you uh, that we're referencing comes from 2017. And and what's the story here? It's like they're they're having trouble and all this stuff and then flash forward today and and you know thank god they're they 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 got it through this um they had the vision the drive to to look at the face look in the face of people who said disbelievers right there's a lot of disbelief yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. and and, yep. and they had the fortitude to say hey no we still believe in this we're gonna we're gonna make it right and and thank God they did, right? Yeah, just, just, yeah, just a couple of things about that. I mean, in that same article, they were talking to ex staffers, one of whom said, um, "You know, we had people asking us, is this another Theranos?'" Which was, you know, a really shady deal. And it's like, no, we we genuinely believe the technology is there. It's just a case of it getting there. You know, that 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 was what it was all about. I mean, we have Bansell now talking about on the back of the the. Um, the current vaccine saying we can be the biggest company in the world. And I'm going to close with a, a final quote from him that he said, this is from the Jan the January 27 article. I'm sure that five years from now, we'll look at 2017 as the inflection point that Moderna went for a liftoff. He said, it's, he said at Monday's presentation, we have a cho chance to transform medicine and we won't quit until we are done. And we have impacted patients. I thought it was amazing that he's saying that five years ago. Well, sorry, three years ago, four years ago, and um, lo and behold, it looks like he's going to be spot on on it. Yeah, let's leave on that, right? So that's the CEO of Moderna, Vancell, who said that back in 2017, and now he's looking like Nostradamus in his prediction. And by the way, it didn't take you five years. It took you about three and a half, four. So congratulations, right? Uh, absolutely. What, yes, yes, so, yes. So John, what a, uh, what a great uh, main portion here. I, I hope it was educational to those that are listening around mRNA vaccines and, and what, a, again, just to see some uh, information back from 2017 coming to fruition in 2021 is great. Uh, John, we're running short of time, so we're going to skip the feedback and questions section. Um, but John, why don't you tell me a little bit, maybe we always like to talk a little bit about our weekend. So, um, and then we'll talk about next week's podcast, but John, what do you got going on? So, Assuming we can dig out of our foot of snow this afternoon, um, I think this 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 weekend is just 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 final Christmas preparations. Um, so one one thing that I've carried over from my childhood in the UK, um, not only do we have a tree, but we used to put up a lot of paper streamers and things like that. Um, I actually brought those over from from the UK. So one of my tasks this weekend will be to decorate a couple of rooms with you know streamers all over over the rooms, etc. The tree is in the house. Um, it isn't decorated because we want to give it two or three days with the cats to get used to it before we start putting things things that dangle off it. We have one cat in particular who who is fascinated by everything, and to go straight to a decorated tree would have been a nightmare. Yeah, um, yeah that's it. Just family family weekends, um, enjoying the you know the countdown to to all getting together and, and relaxing. Yeah, so John, um. It's we don't have snow. It's bitterly cold, but we're supposed to maybe hit the fifties or sixties. So I will find myself outside this weekend. Will be exciting. And then, in terms of Christmas, John, as a side note, you do know that like 
Christmas decorations, Christmas lights, all of those sales are off the roof. They're like 30, 40% higher than any other year. And if you drive around your neighborhood, everybody's got it because there's time on our hands, right? So, John, there's definitely been a, a large movement and you're not alone in decorating. I will share that we have a live tree in our house. Our cat does not necessarily attack it. She likes to play with the gifts. It's looking like Christmas. But what she equates that to is us leaving. So tip, So she's been a little skittish. Oh, really? Because when the tree comes up, we tend to disappear for a week. So she was, she's kind of gotten over it. But for a while, she was, I, I, think, I think my cat, I think my cat needs to be medicated, John, as I keep telling the wife. I think she's sad. But no, um, and, and I, I joke, but she's a great cat. But I do think she sees that tree and knows, certainly if we pull out suitcases, because we are, you know, I'll touch on that in a minute. But whenever we go anywhere, she sees the suitcases, she gets yeah. impressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So ours is a live tree as well. So we have the two old cats. Now their their ritual is to go and sleep behind it. They don't normally that part of the room. They don't normally do. But once the tree's there, and then the other piece is all the cats now decide that the water for the tree that's where they have to drink. They have a they have a cat fountain in the kitchen that's not being touched anymore because the tree water is much much better for yeah, them. Yeah, we have to put foil around it to prevent the cat from going into that. She's she's learned not to do that but the first few years it was like a fountain for her absolutely and um yeah no uh john in terms of um what's happening for me this weekend i do have some christmas shoppings just about done but uh, my son and i uh will go and get there's some um within kansas city there's i forget the name of the artist but we tend to get a real famous uh it, they do things and john maybe you know a little bit about kansas city but we have the plaza and union station they do tree ornaments each year and we go um into a place called crown center so he and i'll go down there this weekend pick out our tree ornament um and it's like a heavy ornament you know really well made it's really cool we've got we've been doing that for about four years now and then we pick out a real nice um we've got these trees glass you know two three foot kind of glass trees that we like made out of crystal actually and so we'll pick up some of that. So that's, you know, this is welcome to COVID times where that's my excitement. But one thing we did learn is I mentioned uh, somebody in my family with some COVID. And so actually we're, we're still unsure of what we're doing for Christmas. So for the last 20 years, I have gone to a place called Columbus, Nebraska, and that's in jeopardy. It's up in the air right now. Sure. If you do that, which, well, fingers which, crossed. You know, kind of stinks. Yeah. But you may find that if you end up doing it at home, you end up with like a different experience and you, you know, you got different family <laughs> traditions spring from yeah. that. So. You're great. That's exactly what my wife said, because she even realizes that as my son gets older and older, that, that, you know, it, it's, you can feel it, not just my son, but everybody's kids are getting older. And, you know, we used to have like 50, 60 people at some of these gatherings in the last few years, it's been maybe 30 ish. But again, that's a number that's a little scary right now. Thirty people, you know. I don't sure. know. I don't want to be part of that. It, again, it it, it um, well, it's to be determined. But all likelihood, Christmas is going to be canceled for the Warino household. And you're right, John. We're going to embrace that, and we're going to have a new one this year. That that's a that's already been discussed. And I, you're spot on. We'll figure it out. Yep, absolutely. Well. I think on that note, we should um, wrap up for this week. And, yeah, and thank you very much. I, I, this, was, this was great. I really enjoyed reading up the, the yeah. RNA stuff because it's all really effectively new to me. So this, this, has, been, this has been fascinating. It's, it's like drinking from a fire hose for both of us. Even though I might have a little bit of knowledge on it, John, it is great to dig in and, and learn more and more. And uh, like you said, it's been an exciting episode. Next week's podcast number 32, John. And we're going to look back at dealing with COVID in 2020 and predictions about the future. Exciting topic. Stay tuned for that one. We're going to give you some bold predictions for 2021. Stay tuned. So, John, with that, have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you next week. Absolutely. Talk to you soon. Thank you.